you sit and lean against the wall and look at the beautiful, riddlesome totality. The summa lies before you like a book, and an unspeakable greed seizes you to devour it. Consequently, you lean back and stiffen and sit for a long time. You are completely incapable of grasping it. Here and there, a light flickers. Here and there, a fruit falls from high trees, which you can grasp. Here and there, your foot strikes gold. But what is it if you compare it with the totality, which lies spread out tangibly close to you? You stretch out your hand, but it remains hanging in invisible webs. You want to see it exactly as it is, but something cloudy and opaque pushes itself exactly in between. You would like to tear a piece out of it. It is smooth and impenetrable like polished steel. So you sink back against the wall. And when you have crawled through all the glow, all the glowing hot crucibles of the hell of doubt, you sit once more and lean back. And you look at the wonder of the summa that lies spread out before you. Here and there a light flickers. Here and there a fruit falls. For you it is all too little. But you begin to be satisfied with yourself. And you pay no attention to the years passing away. What are years? What is hurrying time to him that sits under a tree? Your time passes like a breath of air, and you wait for the next light, the next fruit. The writing lies before you, and always says the same, if you believe in words. But if you believe in things in whose places only words stand, you never come to the end. And yet you must go on an endless road, since life flows not only down a finite path, but also an infinite one. But the unbounded makes you anxious, since the unbounded is fearful, and your humanity rebels against it. Consequently, you seek limits and restraints so that you do not lose yourself. Tumbling into infinity, restraint becomes imperative for you. You cry out for the word which has one meaning and no other, so that you escape boundless ambiguity. The word becomes your God, since it protects you from the countless possibilities of interpretation. The word is protective against is a protective magic against the diamonds of the unending, which tear at your soul and want to scatter you to the winds. You are saved if you can say at last, that is that and only that. You speak the magic word and the limitless is finally banished. Because of that, men seek and make words. He who breaks the wall of words overthrows gods and defiles temples. The solitary is a murderer. He murders the people because the he thus thinks and thereby breaks down ancient sacred walls. He calls up the diamonds of the boundless, and he sits, leans back, and does not hear the groans of mankind, whom the fearful, fiery smoke has seized. And yet you cannot find the new words if you do not shatter the old words. But no one should shatter the old words unless he finds the new word that is a firm rampart against the limitless and grasps more life in it than in the old word. A new word is a new god for old men. Man remains the same. Even if you create a new model of God for him, he remains an imitator. What was word shall become man. The word created the world and came before the world. It lit up like a light in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And thus the word should become what the darkness can comprehend, since what use is the light if the darkness does not comprehend it? But your darkness should grasp the light. The god of words is cold and dead and shines from afar like the moon, mysteriously and inaccessibly. Let the word return to its creator, to man, and thus the word will be heightened in man. Man should be light, limits, measure. May he be your fruit for which you longingly reach. The darkness does not compare, comprehend the word, but rather man, indeed, it seizes him, since he himself is a piece of the darkness. Not from the word down to man, but from the word up to man, that is what the darkness comprehends. The darkness is your mother. She is dangerous. Crossing the abyss. There is a fruit of mindfulness that you can recognize to give you some idea how successful your meditation uh, is or has been. And it's joy. Joy is stalked by depression and melancholy. And there's been a lot of writings and recent work uh, talking about mindfulness as a way to deal with depression. 
Um, I've certainly in my life dealt with depression at different times, but in the last five or seven years, the other aspect of crossing the abyss is exposing yourself and being yourself and letting your secrets, your fears go and your secrets, exposing your secrets. Maybe some secrets have to be kept for, you know, apparent to keep up appearances, but ultimately secrets belie fear and it's best to live out in the open, nor keep secrets of others, you know, nor, nor have others keep your secrets. Um, that's a very difficult step. What is crossing the abyss? I mean, crossing the abyss is moving from creation to what I would what I, what I would agree with Owen Barfield might be called final participation. You could see a phase of our consciousness, of development of our consciousness, in you know, in us becoming individuals and becoming aware of ourselves. That's actually you know, there's a theory, but you can follow this theory. You can research this theory of the bicameral mind. Um, and you can get an, you know, get a little more context there. It's controversial, and it's certainly not open, you know, accepted by most most scientists um, in the field uh, of psychiatry and psychology. Um, but I believe, you know, literature and at different times in history, and you know, you can note where humans became more social, or sorry, more uh, aware and individualized. It's an interesting topic to research if you if you if you want to. Um, the really the abyss that I'm speaking of is and is called death or death, and you can consciously choose to die in life psychologically and mentally and face your death consciously without and deal with letting go and you can find a space then beyond that really that is joyful i tell you because i've tasted it whereas i don't feel like i've i've reached a persistent state of joy i certainly have tasted it and know the signs of it and it it more dominates my my life than it did previously, or at least illuminates my life more than it did previously. And that was due to a lot of yielding and letting go of things. And really imagine what death would be. You're letting go of every aspect of your life because you're leaving your body. I'm not, I'm not saying I know anything about beyond that moment, because as far as I know, that's the last moment that I'll know. Um, that moment of death when my consciousness is no longer, you know, here. And the ancients have called that your light and um, others have called that your soul, your spirit. You know, I won't uh, speculate um, because I don't know. Um, but what I do know is that you can practice your death in life and that brings a strength into your into yourself. And there's it's a psychological process and uh, crossing the abyss is really it's a it's an ancient um, psychology you could say um, that comes from esoter our esoteric traditions and uh, not just Western but Eastern um, and there's many names for it um, but I mean really what what the, what Western magicians talk about when they say crossing the abyss is basically crossing the the gap of death and that's moving from creation to final participation or from creation to uh the sacred it's really finding a faith in your life and finding a faith in yourself and that path over the abyss is you let go of all of the things that you've come to believe and you let go of all of your gods and you let go of all of your hopes and um without a, a knowledge if you have another moment and, you know, you can lose jobs and relationships and family and friends and 
uh, as you make that transition, that psychological transition. But it's a transition that's worth making, in my opinion. And that's why, you know, I'm talking about it, expressing this now. It's been the theme I've been studying recently. And, um, you know, I believe any government should basically allow people to follow any diamond, inner diamond or, or, or leader or guide that they like inside of themselves or, uh, or not. But I think this cycle of us following the words of books and, and men, you know, I'm reading some quotes by Carl Jung um, talking about the diamond and the word. What is the point of what is the purpose of the word and, and why is the word used in magical ritual and ceremonial magic? And what is the importance of word in our culture and in science? And, you know, science has its own language of mathematics um, that, you know, either we created or, or, or discovered. Um, but which I believe we've discovered more of it than we've invented. It seems oftentimes people have made major mathematical jumps just by pure, through pure uh, inspiration and intuition through dreams and fits and starts. Um, and some people just had the gift. They didn't need to work out the proofs. They, but others are very uh, careful to work out the proofs, you know? So there's those that there are those that intuitively see into things. And there's those that, it, that, that measure and explain things. And um, I think true science and true religion are one are the same thing. And that ultimately, you know, we're going to come, you know, we're going to we're going to merge. We're going to merge this inner aspect with our outer aspect. There were pointers to different things and uh, different I, different uh, different concepts that I'm that I came to recognize were acting uh, or that I was acting upon, or that was that that I seemed to be following a, a sort of framework um, that wasn't my own, and uh, you know it happened to me spontaneously, and I came to find that there were others that have systematically written about similar experiences. So it, it had a certain weight in my life because I I felt like, well, what is fate? What does fate imply? Do, do I have free will? Um, you know, if if there is no God, or a, and if there is a nameless you know, if, if it's impossible to have a God in, in this, in this, in this cosmos and the universe, and if we couldn't know, then what, what is all, what are all these religions and, and what, what was my journey, you know, through that, through that door? Um, what did it mean for me? And, uh, it really is, you do feel a responsibility that something so we are, you know, created by nature. You want, if you want to just keep it that simple, because I can't say anything more than that. Evolution brought us here, whatever that is, however it worked. We know we have, we have a lot of theories and some good evidence about of how it works. Um, but, you know, most recently um, they're looking into, you know, there's the people are challenging the old ideas that and principles that evolution is based on. It might work in very dynamic ways in, in ways that we haven't really had the imagination to accept. Um, you know, we can have rapid, you know, evolution. And we've seen that with dogs, you know, in our own, in our own culture, um, just how quickly we've been able to, to change dogs. But um, anyway, you, you know, I think we all have uh, this personal, uh, these personal feelings about the meaning of life and about why we're here. And some of us more than others are asking, you know, what's behind it. And, and, you know, some of some don't even think about it. Of course, most probably don't think about it that much. And they take a lot. Uh, they take a lot of other people's words for things where they shouldn't. They should look into these things themselves. They should turn over. Be willing to turn over. You cannot truly seek and expect to find any thing of value if you're not willing to lose it all. If you're not willing to give it all to get it, and what is it that you're getting? It's not. It's just. It's a. It's just a place of calm. It's a place of relaxation that you can come to, a place of joy, a place where life isn't a, uh, some big game to play, to solve, or some puzzle to solve, but you just see into the meaning of the things that you have in your life. And you reflect off of that and they reflect you. And it's just, it's just a different way of living inside out. And, uh, you know, and, and Carl has certainly done the work here. It takes a lot of work. And uh, I'm fairly lazy, so you know it. It comes and fits, and it goes and fits and starts. Um, but uh, 
more and more I, 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 I do when there's no conflict outside. I just have real quiet, calm, you know, peaceful kind of being. And that's something I didn't always have. And I don't, and, and I have some idea of how I, how I came here, which was through, again, just a, a, a real breaking down of all of my other, my old psychology and my personality and, and just turning it all inside out and reexamining it all and, and letting, realizing that there was a lot in me that was just naturally here that I wasn't letting, wasn't expressing. And, and I gave, I let that, I let that out and I, I pursued, you know, I pursued what I felt to do and how I felt to do it. And, and it's led to some positive results. You know, I can say personally, or I wouldn't mention it. Um, and, uh, I think the hardest thing to do is to see the ugliness and the darkness in yourself and the ways that you hurt people and the ways that we are hurt ourselves. And that's some of the, you know, giving up your secrets, letting go your beliefs, and or being willing to let go and re-examine your beliefs, you know, in a more objective way or subjective way, um, or unconscious or conscious, bringing conscious and unconscious to conscious, into consciousness, you know. Then also, then it's the work of looking into yourself and the things that you don't like about yourself, and and the things that you think are ugly and that you hide and that you don't want to admit, or and those are the hardest things to face, and that's usually the last. I, I believe the last hurdles, you know, to crossing the abyss is, is, is facing, is exposing the secrets about yourself and, and just letting the image in your expectations of your life, letting them just be kind of, let them kind of form in a way. And, and, and if you're not slowing down and if you're not isolating yourself a little bit and, and turning off the outside influence influences, then you don't give yourself a chance to fill from inside. And I think that, 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 that letting that fill, letting yourself fill, it's a, it's a gradual process and it takes time. Another quote from Carl Jung. In St. Ambrose, the serpent hung on the wood. This is a typus Christi, as is the brazen serpent on the cross and Albertus Magnus. Christ as Logos is, synony is synonymous with the Nos, the serpent of the Noahs among the Ophites. The Agatha Diamond, the good spirit, had the form of a snake, and in Philo the snake was considered the most spiritual animal. On the other hand, its cold blood and inferior brain organization do not suggest any noticeable degree of conscious development, while its unrelatedness to man makes it an alien creature that arouses his fear and yet fascinates him. The next quote here. Man shall differentiate himself both from spirituality, from spirituality and sexuality. He shall call spirituality mother and set her between heaven and earth. He shall call sexuality phallos and set him between himself and earth. For the mother and the phallos are superhuman diamonds that reveal the world of the gods. They affect us more than the gods since they are closely akin to our essence. It's from the Red Book. Man is a gateway through which you pass from the outer world of gods, diamonds, and souls into the inner world. Out of the greater into the smaller world, small and inane is man. Already he is behind you, and once again you find yourselves in endless space and the smaller or inner infinity. That's also from the Red Book, page 354. Next quote here. I saw it. I know that this is the way. I saw the death of Christ, and I saw his lament. I felt the agony of his dying, of the great dying. I saw a new God, a child who subdued diamonds in his hand. It's from uh, Liber Novus, Carl Jung, page 254. Next quote. The word becomes your God since it protects you from the countless possibilities of interpretation. The word is protective against, uh, is protective magic against the diamonds of the unending, which tear at your soul and want to scatter you to the winds. Carl Jung, Liber Novus. So Carl's talking about there this idea of the diamonds, the diamonds of the unending. It sounds very ominous, doesn't it? Um, I believe those are the very same. Uh, that's the, that's Cluthu, or um, uh, from Love uh, H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, obviously, that this is uh, this is uh, the thread that that I think the same stream that uh, Lovecraft was speaking of. Um, and, you know, 
uh, Carl had visions. He saw this stuff. I mean, he was like kind of a crazy, scary, you know, scary guy in a way. Um, all of the intelligence. He was super intelligent. They say as intelligent or more intelligent than Nietzsche. Even Nietzsche also a great, a great genius. Um, tormented man. Um, but this idea of, uh, yeah, the, the, these ancient forces, uh, you know, chaotic or early forces in our cult, you know, that, uh, that had, that formed the primordial world and that the whole world, you know, formed to, I mean, these are actually, you know, these are creation myths, obviously. Right. And, and, um, but this, uh, this idea of, uh, of these chaotic forces that are always at our heels trying to rip us apart tell me that our society does not reflect these crazy viruses you know social viruses that tear through our society and try to upend things you know on the right and the left and all in between um you know we've got crazy one crazy lunatic after another trying to make things bring things into their view into their version of the world you know where the reality is is we each have to kind of reinvent our own worlds and with a nod to the co to the collective world, we have to each be grounded in our own inner sense. And most of us are totally disconnected from our inner sense and I, uh, from our unconscious, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's no word to fully express it, right? Uh, I'm going to be, you know, uh, yeah, Lovecraft is very interesting. I'm, I've read a little bit of his work, um, but, you know, some dark, weird, eerie writing, I'll tell you. Um, a man who looked into the mirror, a man who looked into the abyss and what he saw back were these, you know, monsters, you know, which obviously were monsters within himself that he, that he was able to write about. Um, and it probably helped him to write about them, you know, but, uh, sometimes I'm not sure if he's joking <laughs> or making it up. Um, but that was my, my experience with Lovecraft was just how eerily real it felt, uh, and plausible in some strange way. Um, and I, I love, uh, in the mouth of madness, uh, John Carpenter movie. I think was it John Carpenter. Yeah, I think it was John Carpenter. What a creepy movie. Um, but I love craft, you know, based on, based on Lovecraft's, uh, uh, world. So anyway, um, Another quote here. He who breaks the walls of words overthrows gods and defiles temples. The solitary is a murderer. He murders the people because he thus thinks and thereby breaks down ancient sacred walls. He calls up the diamonds of the boundless. I read that earlier. That's from Libra Novus, page 270. Um, we have to over any, you know, you, you find Buddha, me Buddha on the path, you kill him. We have to kill all of our gods. We cannot abide gods. We have to integrate them and kind of create, you know, we are collective beings. We're not unitary. We're not single individuals. Our minds are even split in many ways. And it's a collection. It's a chorus. It's an overlapping, they're overlapping nets of energy, you know, that make our personality and our minds. And we still, we don't understand it. I mean, still very far from understanding it, I'm sure. Um, but they keep saying, you know, any day they're going to figure it out. They're, they're, you know, they're mapping the brain. I mean, that's like, you know, it's like what we did with the genetic code. You know, you can find all the letters, but you have no idea how they go together and how to put them into different combinations and how they came together to make what, you know, you have to, de you have to, you have to, uh, you have to reverse engineer it, which is what we're doing with our genetics. And we're, we're trying to do the same thing with the mind, but we're taking a very, we're doing it from a physical perspective and it's not just physical. It's, it's this inner, it's this inner world that we can't, and none of us can really speak about, but we all have feelings about and experience. Right. And this is something that, that Carl Jung was able to give voice to in a very, in a very, uh, kind of powerful way with hit with what he wrote about. So, uh, next, next quote, spirituality and sexuality are not your qualities, not things you possess and encompass rather they possess and encompass you since they are powerful diamonds, the manifestations of the gods and hence reach beyond you existing in themselves. So Carl Jung definitely had, he came from a religious background and he definitely 
you know, but but he saw he saw you know the the traditional views of God as very archaic and simple, and uh, but but he saw maybe our emotions, you know, as as the foundations for the myths of the gods, and different archetypes, right, that are common to us. That's his big discovery, um, and uh, you know, he was dealing with very powerful stuff, and there was a a cult of personality that formed around him. But, um, you know, they thought, some of them, that he was like a form of Christ returned because he was so intelligent and so powerful and he, his magic was so strong and he had such a, he was such a, 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 a such a powerful mystic, you know, they were mesmerized by him. And, uh, but they also, he was also surrounded by a lot of women and they seemed to really balance him out. But he was also, you know, a, quite a sexual person. And, you know, he had a mistress that lived with him and his wife for years and years, um, you know, kind of scandalous. Um, so he was a very open minded man, a man before his time, uh, a man ahead of his time, for sure, uh, in many, 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 many ways and probably ahead of us, too. Um, and he saw some things coming in our person in our culture that are coming to pass. And it's kind of eerie how good his predictions have been. Um, so uh, he's definitely somebody to study today to have a better idea and to understand what's happening underneath all of the actions in our public, you know, that are happening right now in politics. Um, politics is interesting. Secular politics is based on, and you're foolish, you know, not to realize, anyone's be foolish not to realize that secular politics are based on theological politics. And there is a real strong uh, movement within the Christian church an apocalyptic movement where they want the end, where they see the end of the world and this causes a very big you know schism with progressives and others who are trying their best to make the world a better, as good as we can make it and these others really have this idea in islamic religion as well and judaism um you know they they're waiting for their the messiah to come they don't recognize the earlier messiah of the christians and they're waiting for the for the for the messiah Mashiach, I think, to come, and the devout uh, Hasid, Hasidic Jews are very serious about this, <laughs> and, the, and the Christians are serious about it, and Islamic folks are serious about it. They all see the end of the world, and now you have postmodernists and secular people that have written about the end of history, that we're living in the end of history right now, and what does that mean? And I mean, but I, I would just say, you know, we had uh, every every generation has a chance to reignite the old would and bring new life into it into those old ways and old words so i don't feel that we should be bound by the prophecies of the past we should not be beholden or bound to prophets or mystics or anybody saying what the future is going to be but we have to balance it out with that there that over over time there are long arcs of time in history that take a long time to play out so in a sense we have maybe you know we have choices in the moment that we can make, but ultimately, we're the you know history is following a long arc of a lot of different actions that have occurred from before, and you know like a snake's tail, we don't know the end of it. it, it we're we're kind of like it's it's uncoiling itself, and so we live in this very uncertain time, and that time is being vict people are being victimized by tyrants and authoritarian leaders because I mean one thing about human psychology. We, we, does, we do better with strong leaders, central leadership, making decisions so that people can play their parts. They want a, a leader to make the big decisions and, and, and for them. And that is just the way it is with us. That's our hierarchy, our social hierarchy. And, you know, we, so, but, you know, what do you do when you can't trust any of the people that are supposed to make the political decisions for us? You know, I mean, then you have to get involved again. Then you have rebellions, then you have revolutions, you know. Um, and there seems to be a real revolutionary spirit rising within the white Anglo, you know, portions of the country because of their th threat they feel to their culture. And that is ironic because they all, particularly most of them, follow a religion that talks about loving your neighbor and loving the other. And instead of, it's incredible that Donald Trump was able to capture the Christians when their whole idea, the idea behind their religion was treat the other as a friend, 
not as a don't demonize them. The Old Testament is an example of lots of that kind of thing. Destroy that people, destroy that people. It's pretty, pretty crazy. And then you have the New Testament, though, which, you know, that's what the Christian evangelical faith is based on. Um, you know, Paul, it's the Pauline, you know, gospel. It's the Pauline doctrine. Paul was trying to take, you know, the ideas of Judaism to the Gentiles and to the world. And it's... Uh, it's just it's creating a tension in the world these 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 religions right based on old ideas you know these tensions that are just unbearable and uh you know everything's busting from the seams and i don't see any end in sight i i, I just i don't i mean we have powerful forces equally waging war against one another and that can't be very good in the long run it's got to balance out but with a lot of it seems with a lot of possible damage in the process and I think everybody knows we're on a plane that's going to crash. We're just trying to bring it in as gently as we can. And a lot of people don't want to accept that about society, but it's true. It really is true. Um, we are, we are heading, we have already crashed. We've already, the engines have already shut off and now we're gliding and our choices or maybe we have one engine left, you know, barely going. And, and our choices now dictate, you know, do we try to land here and, and, you know, take a longer, you know, airport or do we hit a, hit a closer one? Because, uh, you know, we're going down and there isn't anything that's going to stop it. It's capitalism itself. That's the flaw and the motivations. And you'll find plenty. Oh my God. Everybody in the secular world tell you that's not true, that that's our only way out of it. But that's just the lie of capitalism. Um, you know, we are the, co I mean, well, I, I, I'm not going to get into it, but the, the you know capitalism is an uh, is an in, we cannot tolerate capitalism any longer in its current form and we've known that for a long time we can't consume energy the way we have been and we're gonna have to make major decisions now drastic decisions because we've allowed a generation the generation before us uh or two to delay it okay because they couldn't accept what was happening in the world and uh, we live in that shadow of that world. And now we have nuclear bombs flying overhead all the time. And it's a, it's a pretty crazy thing. But in, that, in the midst of all that, huh, you can find your way. And that's kind of amazing. And maybe that's the point, is that as much as we look outside of ourselves and outside of the culture and to other people and to leaders to, 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 to take care of it all and make it all work, we realize that we have to make it work first in our own lives. And that's the hard work. That's the real work. And and demonizing others is not going to get us there. It's got to be believing that we're meeting friends. And even those dark things and the darkness in ourselves, those are traits that you have to welcome as guests. Welcome guests. Even the darkest things in you. Welcome guests. You know, don't be ashamed of these things. And that's the greatest thing, I think. All I mean, if any of us you know, can make that journey and find peace with themselves, good and bad, I think you're doing pretty good. I do not claim such, <laughs> um, but I do, I do, I do strive for and, and strive for a mix of trying to let things happen and, and using the right amount of energy when needed. But, um, you know, like I said, man, I can see the lights on the shore. They're waiting. And I don't know what it means on that other side. I don't know what that is over there. But I see a city. I see something there. And yeah, I guess in a way that's become a light within me that guides me in that, um, you know, it cost me a lot to be here and stand in the middle of my life. It cost me a lot of things before, but it really didn't cost me anything because those were all, you know, those really didn't serve me. Those things in the past didn't serve me. And well, and I didn't serve them well, and uh, because it was a false bargain. I didn't choose my name. Someone gave me a name. And now I've, I've chosen my name, Smelly the Goat. And that's, you know, to, to be a little transparent, Smelly the Goat was, became my first, my, my first magical name. And uh, that, that psychological construct within me, the, the goat, has led me, um, you know, through the abyss, over the abyss, and taught me a lot of things about myself and helped me uh, to learn a lot about the world that I didn't really realize before by by using this magical name and 
and uh, and and imbuing it, let it, giving it life, giving it focus, letting it spread its wings, so to speak, within my personality, and permeate my life in a way, you know, living like a goat, recognizing the patterns of a goat within me, you know, and kind of exploring that. That was a way in somehow that some, you know, inner process kind of taught me about myself. How does that? How is that even possible? I don't even know. It's a mystery to me how the how this all works in a way, but it just does. You can just trust it and. Yeah, I didn't know that that was the way that people did magic, but that was actually one of the, that's one of the fundamentals of, you know, um, one of the steps of, in, in a magical life. And, you know, you can live your life as a magician with conscious awareness of it and making choices or making things happen, uh, you know, out of righteous, you know, good intent. Um, or, you know, you can just be unconscious and life will just happen to you and you'll be terrified. Um, and you'll hold on to it and you won't even know what it meant. You know, for, what did it mean for you in the end? You know, I mean, you didn't, it, I don't know. It, there's a whole b bunch in between that, but that's the gist of it. So, you know, living life ma as, you know, with magically is realizing how, you know, the role of illusion and word and logos, you know, within our culture and our lives and in our minds, learning how the mind perceives things and actually fools us most. We're fooled by our own minds. Uh, it constructs an image that isn't real. It's just a, it's just an, uh, it's just a, it's its interpretation of the, of, of, of the, of the energy and radio waves and magnet, you know, all that stuff around us, you know, and our brains just evolved in the way they did to perceive what they do. And we can't take that as final reality. You know, but we have to base our experience in that, in this collective, you know, place. So, you know, it, this is happening. You can't deny it. <laughs> You're in it. It's happening. It's persistent. You know, it's, it's a stubborn illusion. Um, you know, that's, you know, that's what they say the ego is, right? But, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, being able to be yourself and let yourself express, you can show yourself the way and it's kind of amazing that it works. Um, and you can call that intuition. You can call it your, you know, your inner voice. You can call it your, your true will. You could call it your heart. You know, there's a lot of words for it, names for it, but there, without a doubt, we do know within us, I know within myself when I've transgressed and done something that's lower than and beneath myself, what I'm capable of. And uh, I don't know why life has to be like that, but that's the way it is. And and uh, we have choices in what we what we do matters, and not so much what we feel or think, but what we do. And uh, and I think mastering those the inner life and the inner darkness, or I would say integrating and partnering with it, being pierced by it and letting your it pierce in in it, allowing you to peer to venture into it. There is some kind of meant. There's a psychological benefit to an individual, um, and it works a lot better than just secular. You know, society is reason and logic. You know, it's it's a it's a holistic view of the world that incorporates science and and not and logic and and reasoning. But that is not the end. That's not the ultimate measure of things. You know, it's just a way of of experiencing this shared reality which in a way is an illusion in that it's even based on particles you know in the quantum that uh you know that's you know we i don't understand it we don't really understand it um but that things don't really exist in concrete form you know they're always in at the lowest level they're they're there and they aren't where are they when they aren't <laughs> and what is this place where they are uh, you know it's it's kind of weird um you know that 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 the wave you know particle duality and all that i'm not a physicist so don't take my word for any of that but that's you know a little bit uh my 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 popular uh common man's understanding of quantum physics um but uh you know we have ai coming now and we have uh artificial intelligence you know here and now we have quantum computers on the horizon that are going to increase our calculating ability in unimaginable staggering power what are we going to do with that power you know what how is that going to change us because it certainly will change us 
um, our interaction with our technology changes us. I mean, for sure. And, and uh, you know, but when we have, yeah, so we're living on the edge of, I don't know, it's such an unknown, you know, the theory of everything would let you calculate the location of particles in the past or in the future, basically, um, if such a thing was possible or if such a thing exists uh, or is knowable by our species. Um, and uh, I don't know, you know, knowing when everything's going to happen seems like, you know, cheating in a way. But I think awareness is you expand your awareness by by learning to treat everything as a guest and by and by treating everything as a friend um even the negative stuff and uh yeah i mean that's what i feel ultimately what crossing the abyss is it's 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 move it's a form of you know rebirth you know within your own life and uh i think there's a lot of names for it and i can't claim exclusivity of anything um or even originality and you know i'm regurgitating a lot of ideas from other people in my understanding of them um but i'm just because tr i'm trying to talk about something that we can't really talk about which you could talk about that forever they do god every, people on youtube constant talking 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 about these ideas um you know you get lost in them um, and you're listening to my, if you're listening to my voice right now, don't get lost. And it's easy to get lost in my mind. I mean, we all can get lost in other minds and we like to get lost in other minds, get out of our own now and then. Right. But you've come to find out that we, we're basically kind of all the same with just mixtures of, uh, you know, traits, but it seems to be the same strange mixtures of, of the same kind of patterns, you know, I don't know. Um, drawing no ultimate conclusions, nor predicting anything. Uh, just saying that um, there is something to this idea of uh, the diamond and the inner the inner guide, I guess, or whatever. And somehow, if you allow yourself and let go of things and let are willing to face your fear, somehow you can find a strength within yourself that you didn't know was there, and it's worth doing. <clears throat> Uh, doing it for real, not on a surfacey level, not for, I think that it just, it needs to be an, an earnest, heartfelt, pure intention. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I hope you don't have to be in the desert, but on my experience is you got to be in that, de you got to, that desert's finding, you're going to find that desert sometime. And either you're going to take the oasis and the illusion of the oasis, or you're going to, or you're going to dig for water somehow. And, and, you know without any hope of the next breath and that's the kind of desperation somehow it unlocks something psychologically within us maybe that's just cracking up you know what i'm describing it's just a psychological breakdown maybe you know and you just got to pick the pieces up and put yourself back together all right another Quote, if I am not conjoined through the uniting of the below and the above, I break down into three parts, the serpent, and in that or some other animal form I roam, in my case it was a goat, living nature daimonically, arousing fear and longing, the human soul living forever within you, the celestial soul, as such, dwelling with the gods, far from you and unknown to you, appearing in the form of a bird. That's from Carl Jung's Soul to Him, Black Books. Because I was a thinker and caught sight of the hostile principle of pleasure from the from forethinking, it appeared to me as Salome. If I had been one who felt and had groped my way toward forethinking, then it would have appeared to me as a serpent and coiled diamond, if I had actually seen it. Carl Jung from Liber Novus. As I once dreamt, my will to live is a glowing diamond who makes the consciousness of my mortality hellish difficult for me at times. Carl Jung, Letters, Volume 2, page 119. But the diamond reeks nothing for, of that, for life at the core is steel on stone. I read an interesting... Um, 
metaphor or a guide's uh, description of what it is to embody yourself in life. And that you are an aperture. Your mind is an aperture in this 3D world. And, uh, and there's something moving, moving the aperture. There's something controlling the aperture. You're, you're like the, you're on the end of a scope and something is looking in almost like a microscope through you into this, into this world. And, and, you know, what do you, in that analogy, uh, you know, does the, does the camera at the end of the scope have a, does it, it, it knows what it needs to know to be a camera at the end of the scope. It doesn't know about why the scope. It doesn't know about the doctor behind the scope. It doesn't know about the patient, really. Uh, it's just there. And that is a very interesting way, I thought, to look at a, a possible, you know, the psychic uh, possible, you know, the, the, the way our, maybe our psyche works, you know, collectively um, and individually. And uh, it's kind of scary because then what kind of free will does a camera have? Well, be the best camera you can be. Be the clearest camera you can be, right? I mean, it's almost like we're cameras with a built-in AI to keep the, the lens clean in 3D world. But the lens gets really dirty. And then, and then there, it's of no use. It's an instrument and a tool of no use. And what happens to that? You know, you don't have a need for that anymore, right? I don't know. Um, what's looking in on the other end? what's looking through us what is the app what are we the aperture to and of and, and from um that's you know i don't know that those are answers you can't really questions you can't really answer um there it's just an interesting uh you know uh, it's an interesting analogy um or thought you know thought picture you know but huh we are to uh you know hey i'm just a lens so be the best damn lens you can be, be as clean, be the best camera you can be. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, it makes life a lot. It would, it would make life a lot more understandable and simpler if to know that we were just like, you know, the exploring eyes of some, of some, you know, we don't know what the dark matter is out there. We can't see it, but maybe it could see us. Maybe we're, you know, how do we know that what we can't see out there, which is a most of the universe uh, what do we know about it? I, I mean, you you can't create a God of the gaps, you know, um, and, and, and assume that it's got to be something, you know, you can't project onto that emptiness, what you think and what you want it to be. But it seems the way our minds work, it seems certainly plausible the way the patterns in the world, you know, that, that somehow, you know, we might interact with f things unseen uh, or that we're unable to see. You know, I mean, that's what are ghosts? You know, what are all these UFO sightings? What are all these weird Bigfoot sightings? Right. I mean, people see things and they say things and a lot of people make it up, I'm sure. Um, and uh, but there's a there's a lot of people that are credible that that speak, uh, you know, as if these things occurred. And if they occurred in your mind, is there any difference that it did it occur in the physical world or not? No, I mean, you know, probably not. I mean, what you think happened is what happened. <laughs> you know, we, we are constantly rewriting our old memories, you know, that's a fact. And, uh, um, we're creating, we're recreating ourselves all the time, rewriting our rewriting. You can rewire your circuits. You can, you can shunt past, you know, you can create a, a shunt, you know, circuit across broken wires, but you got to go back and you got to find the broken wires and you got to put them back together. And, you know, and you can, uh, you know, again, what is, what is the point of all this? I mean, living mindfully, living with focus, living with intention, um, you know, it's a source. It can lead to joy and uh, help you to deal with the shit that you, you know, can't let go of. Uh, you know, if you, uh, if you focus yourself on within yourself on, on deepening that, 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 that spring that you found, that, that you may have found, um, you know, keep digging and let it grow. You know, more and more water is going to fill, fill you up. And it's in the, in the, in the more that you're, the more your capacity expands, the more you're going to give. I mean, it's just going to, I've only, I can only say that I've experienced, um, positive results from these psychological explorations. 
And I had a lot of help from my friends of many kinds. My dogs, my wife, my few, the few friends that I've, that I have left. And, uh, yeah, I guess I'll, that's all I have to say right now.